there have been changes and even some cutbacks with Royal Caribbean in the last couple of months. And today we're going to talk about what these changes are and does it matter? Here we go. Hey everyone, it's Matt from RoyalCaribbeanBlog.com. Like everybody, I don't like getting less than I used to before, and the cruise industry is definitely changing. One trend we've noticed certainly since the start of 2023, even going back maybe before the start of the new year, is that the cruise industry, including Royal Caribbean, have had to cut back, alter, or otherwise change up some of the approaches to the cruise experience. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. There's economics of the world, there's economics of the cruise industry, there is the quarterly profits and losses, and the fact the cruise industry is facing billions with a B dollars in debt as a result of the shutdown that lasts from 2020 into 2021. I've gotten a lot of feedback from you, our viewers, about these changes and talking about what it all means because there's a lot of discussion about these changes and what sort of material impact does it have on your cruise experience. And let me be very clear about what we're talking about today. There are, in a lot of cases, actual cutbacks. I'm not here to make it seem like there aren't any cutbacks. There are. There are changes. Things are happening in the world of Royal Caribbean, so I'm not here to deny that. The issue is, do these changes actually matter? Meaning, do these things actually impact your cruise experience? Or are they changes in the sense that, yes, something has changed, but overall, the experience, the cruise vacation doesn't really change all that much. Let's talk about all these changes. Starting up with number one, a big one, once a day housekeeping. This is a change that we've talked about in previous videos here, but it's also something that's in the process, meaning not every single Royal Caribbean cruise ship has done this yet, but Royal Caribbean is slowly changing over its ships one at a time to once per day for non-suite cabin housekeeping, meaning instead of your stateroom attendant coming to your cabin twice a day in the morning and in the evening, they will now only come once a day if you're staying in a balcony or lower type of category. Passengers have the choice if they prefer to have their stateroom attendant service the cabin in the morning or the evening. And as you might imagine, this change has gotten a lot of people fired up. In fact, when I first heard about it, I was upset about it because we've had twice a day for years and years and years. But the reality of it, and a lot of people pointed this out, is that twice a day servicing of your cabin is a little bit much, not just in the grand scheme of the travel industry, but in general, because I don't know many places in which you get twice a day service, right? Certainly, if you look at the hotel sector, my goodness, if you get once a day, that's pretty lucky. Once a week. That's kind of even above the norm at this point. So certainly the travel industry as a whole has changed and Royal Caribbean is adjusting to that. But of course, let's be realistic about this. Why are they making this change? To save money. Because you have to remember the travel industry, especially the cruise industry, has lost so much money. And essentially what I think what we're seeing right now is the cruise industry trying to rectify that, right the ship, so to speak, and do what they can in order to save as much money as they can so they can be profitable and continue to go forward and, you know, obviously not go into bankruptcy or anything among those lines. They want to pay off these loans and you got to cut costs somewhere. And I think that's just where Royal Caribbean sees this opportunity because you've got to save money where you can. Every little bit helps. So does it matter in the grand scheme of your cruise experience? Now, to be fair, I have not actually experienced this yet myself in terms of staying in a cabin that this applies to. So I'm only talking about now hypotheticals in the sense of what I would experience. But as others have pointed out, the reality is twice a day was a lot. And there are benefits to having only once a day. As an example, if you choose evening service, if you want to sleep in now, you don't have to worry about getting out of your room. Oftentimes, we've had conversations with my kids like, hey, we got to get going because we need to make sure we're out of the room so our stateroom attendant can come in and change the room over. But the reality is the biggest thing people need on a daily basis maybe are new towels at the very least. And those are changed once a day with the once a day service. And you can always request more towels if you need them. And yes, if you have a sofa or a Pullman bed that needs to be put up or put together or undone, they can come in and do that in addition to the once a day service. Royal Caribbean has said that. So yes, it's a change and it's a cutback. I'm not here to deny that, but I'm also saying that I don't think in the grand scheme of things, it really materially impacts negatively your cruise experience. It seems like a lot of people certainly get that. And I was actually surprised how many cruisers seem to be in favor of this change because of the fact that they just didn't like always having to go around the stateroom attendant twice a day. It kind of frees up their day in the sense that they only have to have it once a day. It's a little bit easier to plan around, especially in the evening hours in which you're automatically probably out of the cabin for dinner or evening activities. 
Now, this leads me into the next change for Royal Caribbean, and that is that they recently increased gratuities, which a lot of people have pointed out to. Okay, so they're cutting back the housekeeping, and they're also increasing gratuities for crew members. So the automatic gratuity has gone up, and this actually occurred a little later last year. This happened in September. But essentially, the standard cabin for junior suites and below, the daily automatic gratuity rate went from $14.50 to $16 per day per person, and the suite gratuity rate went from $17.50 to $18.50 per day per person. Now, for suites, the twice-a-day housekeeping remains, so we're not going to talk about that. But, of course, the amount that you're charging for the standard cabin for, you know, basically inside, ocean view, balcony, and junior suites went up from $14.50 to $16. So a lot of people pointing out, well, you're paying more for gratuities and you're getting less service. Now, I would point out, first and foremost, this was the first gratuity raise for the crew members since 2018. So they went from 2018 to 2022 with obviously a big gap in the middle with the cruise industry shut down with no raises. I don't know about you. I like having a raise what, at least once every couple of years, if not once every four years at the very least. So yes, it is more. But in the grand scheme of things, of economic factors and whatnot, a once every four year raise really isn't that bad. In fact, before the shutdown, Royal Caribbean and other cruise lines were basically raising gratuities right around once every year or so. So I don't have a big problem with this one because, again, it was something that was occurring regularly and it's been in a huge gap since the last one. So I'm okay with it. Yes, you're paying more in the sense of gratuities. You're getting less service. I get that. But again, you have to look at the bigger picture here. They hadn't had a braise since 2018. That's a long time. Next up is a change that a lot of our readers actually told me about at RoyalCaribbeanBlog.com, and I almost didn't believe them until I actually saw it with my own eyes, and that is if you're on the fixed-price menu at Izumi Sushi, they've actually cut the amount of sushi rolls that you get. So interestingly, Royal Caribbean has made a change for the fixed-price option at Sushi, in which you paid $34.99 per person before the 18% gratuity, and it included one small plate, two large plates, which could be a combination of sushi rolls, assorted sashimi, or rice and noodle bowls, and a single dessert. Basically, if you went for this particular option, whether you had a dining package or you were just paying cash, essentially, you were getting half the size of the sushi rolls. And we tested this out on Symphony of the Seas, and this is absolutely true. The truly weird thing about this is it only applies to the fixed price. So if you go to Zumi Sushi and you don't do the fixed price and you order, you know, a tuna roll, you're going to get the full size portion, which is strange because, again, with fixed price, you get four pieces per roll. If you order it individually, you get eight pieces per roll. And if you're on a dining package, by the way, which is very common, especially at Izumi, you don't have to do the fixed price option. You can simply say, I don't want to do fixed price. I want to order as I go. Now, certainly there are some advantages to the fixed price, especially if you're not doing sushi, I would argue. Like if you want to get, you know, a udon noodle bowl and some other entree, there is an advantage there. So looking at it, yes, 100% cut back. I'm not sure why they had to cut it in half there. But what's odd about it is it only applies to the fixed price. So my advice to anybody going to Izumi Sushi is, if you want to do sushi especially, don't order the fixed price. Go with the a la carte option instead. You're going to get full-size rolls, and you'll probably come out around the same amount of money, especially when you consider the fact that maybe you don't want dessert at Azumi. You can get dessert somewhere else. That's a couple dollars saved. And in addition to that, you can also be a little more creative with some of your ordering. And sushi in and of itself is very conducive to sharing, so you might actually find a better value ordering that full-size roll and sharing some of the pieces with your table mates there. Speaking of dining, another change Royal Caribbean made in 2022 was a change to the unlimited dining plan in which if you go to a la carte restaurants, you can only go to an a la carte restaurant once per day. So for restaurants like Playmakers or Portside Barbecue, for the $20 food credit you get, you can only be used once a day there. Before this change, you could go to Playmakers as an example. We'll use this one as our primary example here. And you could go there, you know, for lunch, you go there for dinner, you go there for snack, you go as many times as you wanted. But Royal Caribbean has basically said, it's once a day per person at these restaurants. Now, that isn't to say you can't go to more than one. As an example, you go to Playmakers for lunch and then go to Portside Barbecue for dinner, and that would be totally fine. The reason why Royal Caribbean is making this change is to cut down on people who are essentially camping out at Playmakers and spending a lot of time there, especially in special sporting events like the NCAA tournament or the World Cup or maybe even NFL playoffs, in which they would spend a lot of time, many, many hours, and order a ton of food. And they were just sitting there, and they would start off with a snack here and another order here. And basically, they were consuming a lot of resources over which Royal Caribbean anticipated what the dining plan was all about. Now, is it a cutback? Yes, because the dining package is called the unlimited dining package, but it's not truly unlimited. 
you're still able to go to Playmakers and enjoy a meal here once a day with the dining package. The difference is you can't overload the dining package and really go here and again, order a ton of food more so than I think what the intention of the dining package was. Is it a change? Is it a cutback? Yes. And yes, in the sense of an unlimited dining package is no longer unlimited, but for me, at least once a day at Playmakers is totally fine. And as somebody who's been to Playmakers many times and tries to go there in which people are basically camped out, enjoying all the games and spending all afternoon there, it's great for them, but it's also hard to maybe get in and grab a spot if you want to come in for simply a meal. So if that changes that, I'm not even sure. I think this is more of just a cost thing more than anything. Nonetheless, I understand why they're doing it. And as long as I get my once a day there, that's usually enough for me. Certainly, I'd love to go there for maybe lunch and then maybe have a late night nacho dish. I'm not above that by any means, but at the same time, I, there's plenty of other options there. And of course, the dining package has not changed in the sense of other cover charge restaurants in which, yes, you could go to multiple cover charge restaurants in the same day. No problem at all. And lastly, we have some new changes to the Crown and Anchor Society that have been coming out. In fact, there's been Crown and Anchor changes for a little while here, but the most recent one was a new design for the Crystal Block and changes to other freebies. So beginning March 10th, which just recently happened, Royal Caribbean announced some new Crystal Block designs for its top tier members that they could receive. In addition to that, they were also changing the welcome stacks and beverages. For Emerald members and higher, you no longer have the option to pre-select your welcome beverages, and you'll all receive complimentary water in the cabin. For Diamond Plus and Pinnacle members, the Wash and Fold benefit is altered slightly in the sense you can only do it on the Wash and Fold Laundry Promotion Day instead of every day of the cruise, and of course, the new Crystal Block design. Now, when it comes to all these things, here's what I think about this. Number one, this obviously only impacts the top tier members, Emerald and higher. Number two, for the change to the Welcome Sacks and Beverages, this is probably the most material impact for people that are out there because there were people that really enjoyed having complimentary beer or wine when they got on board the ship in their cabin. That was a nice benefit. Now, me personally, I always opted for water because I usually had a drink package and I would get my drinks elsewhere. So water, especially having conveniently located in my cabin, was more important, but I totally get this is a negative change for people that wanted to have that. In terms of the laundry benefit, the wash and fold special, you know, this will be interesting to see if they actually enforce this rule or not. But on principle, once per sailing, and this would be a five-night sailing or longer that you can only have it on, I guess it requires more forethought, but it's a change I can live with, not the end of the world, and more often than not, I actually forgot to ever take advantage of this benefit. And then the crystal blocks, one which which I don't love. I think the old crystal block, the ones that were etched in with lasers looked really cool. No doubt this is a cost savings thing there. That being said, I was never a real crystal block collector. I know there's many people out there that love their crystal blocks and have huge collections. I understand that. There's no doubt this one is definitely cheaper to produce because instead of having it be laser etched, it appears to be just a generic block in which they can slide in and out different pictures into the crystal block. It's a change. I get it. I'm not trying to sound like a Royal Caribbean defender here, but... I don't think anybody ever cruised for the crystal block specifically, but I understand if you're disappointed because you're not getting the same design, especially if the new design doesn't exactly look as good as the old design. Totally get that. And then, of course, we have the main dining room menu. Who could forget about that, right? Because this has been one of the most noticeable changes for cruisers in 2023. And essentially, there's been a new menu. There's new theme menus. And I would say there's two major components to the new menu change besides the new menu in and of itself. Number one, there are themes to every night more so than there were before. So there's French night and Caribbean night. So there's kind of a semi-cohesive theme. I say semi because on like Caribbean night, there's still French onion soup or escargot, but I digress. And number two, there's no longer a classics option, meaning there's no longer a standby menu you can always fall back on in addition to the changing daily items. And there's one more change, which of course I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, which is lobster. There's still lobster available, complimentary, on the second formal night if your cruise is long enough for one. The difference is it's no longer unlimited. After the first lobster, there's an additional charge to order additional ones beyond that. And for some people, that's a bigger issue there. So let's talk about the menu changes and the material impacts to the cruise experience. Now, I've tried out the new menus on two sailings so far, and I absolutely love the new changes. Let me tell you why I actually like this. Number one, most importantly, the speed, the swiftness of service. Every single time we've been there, we've been in and out somewhere between, I would say, 70 and 90 minutes total. From when we are handed our menus until desserts are served, I've been impressed because prior to this menu change, the main dining room was kind of a Russian roulette when it came to how long will we be there for? Sometimes it was an hour, sometimes it was two hours, and even longer. But there's no doubt Royal Caribbean has hit a home run with the swiftness of service. I get it. It's not the wind jammer. You don't want to be in and out in 30 minutes. It's not that. You're still there for, 
right around an hour and a half, which is pretty much what I expect from any sit-down restaurant, whether it's on a cruise ship or at home. So I actually like this change overall. Most importantly, the new menu changes, by the way, like 70%, I'd estimate, of the menu items across all the menus are pretty much holdovers from the old menu. So while we're using the term new menus, reality is most of the items on the new menus are actually holdovers from the old menu. Now, as it pertains to lobster, listen, if you compare it to what it used to be, you're absolutely right. There's less lobster complimentary than you used to be able to get. Now, Royal Caribbean has said this on the record that it was never intended to be an all-you-can-eat lobster experience. It was rather just the reality of it, but things have changed, and I think probably for mostly costs, there are some other issues in terms of supply chain and whatnot, but at the end of the day, you're only getting one lobster per person at your table. Admittedly, as somebody who does not eat lobster, it's hard for me to understand the material impact because it doesn't impact me personally, but you know, if they were to say, hey, Matt, you can only have one spaghetti bolognese a day, I would certainly <laughs> maybe be more upset about that, but I find other options that are there. I get it. If you're a big lobster fan and if you were used to getting maybe two or three lobster tails on lobster night, I get that. It's a change and it's a cutback. It's a negative there, but I think you're still going to be able to get your lobster tail and it's still going to have that opportunity. If you want to pay extra, you could do that. If you're on vacation, splurge a little bit, or it is what it is and it's the change that Royal Caribbean has made. With the new menu changes, I really think the swiftness of service has greatly benefited the main dining room experience, and I actually like some of the new changes, some of the new items that Royal Caribbean has added to the menu, so overall, I'm pretty happy with the changes there. But overall, what I really look at is, certainly, there are some declines here, and there are some changes over here, but the travel industry, and more specifically, the cruise industry, is still struggling to get around some of the major financial issues that they encountered with the shutdown of 2020 and 2021. Again, I think the change today is very different than the change we would have seen in 2019. And you can sit here and argue what would have happened had there not been a shutdown every day, but that's a whole different discussion for a different day, right? On the one hand, there are changes and cutbacks. On the other hand, if you look at the travel industry in general, cruising is still very much a much better experience overall. Many hotels don't offer maid service during your stay unless it's so many days into your stay. You need more towels. You have to actually go to the front desk for that. And the travel industry has lost billions of dollars. That includes other areas of the travel sector. And the cruise segment is not immune to those symptoms. It's definitely not what it used to be. When you lose billions of dollars, there is going to be an effect on it. You have to realize that we're not in the same situation today as we were in 2019. That doesn't mean you have to like the changes. I'm not here to say everybody should be rah-rah, kumbaya, everything's fine. Just because Royal Caribbean has restarted operations, they did not recover the billions of dollars of lost revenue and the billions of dollars of debt they accumulated to stay in business. It's going to take a decade or more to recover from that. And in the meantime, they've got to do their best to stay afloat financially and be able to pay off those loans. And that's why we are seeing these changes and there very well could be more cutbacks, changes, alterations, whatever you want to call it going forward. Now, all that being said, I still enjoy cruising and I've booked more cruises to go on and I look forward to going on more cruises. I don't like the changes, but I understand why it has changed and you have to be realistic about the realities of our world today. So that's my look at the recent changes there. I am sure that some people will completely disagree with me. And if you think I'm being a Royal Caribbean fanboy, well, I am a Royal Caribbean fanboy, number one, but number two, this is the reality of the world we live in. Things change, things evolve. We don't get chocolates on our pillows anymore. We don't do the things we did in the 1970s, 1980s, heck, even the 1990s on cruise ships. It's always an evolution. Sometimes it's for the good, sometimes maybe not so much, but it's part of the ride that we experience as part of cruising. But most importantly to me, the core experience, the major part of what draws me to cruising is still very much there. There's still very much value there in terms of what I get for my dollar and what I get for the overall experience. And certainly I look forward to all of that. And I don't think these changes and cutbacks have necessarily negatively impact that core experience. But now I want to hear from you in the comments below. What do you think about these changes and these cutbacks, and these alterations to the cruise experience? And which of these changes will have a material impact on your cruise? Meaning which of these will definitely 100% one-to-one impact your cruise experience going forward. Let me know in the comments below. Please keep it civil down there. And if you like this video, or at least you enjoyed the discussion, maybe you don't like the topic, but you can at least enjoy the conversation we're having here. Hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications. That way, YouTube lets you know we have a brand new video to share. This has been Matt from RoyalCaribbeanBlog.com, and we'll talk again real soon.